play here. I didn't know it was going to be a stage. <laughs> feel like I'm back in high school. What's your record? Uh, the, huh? I, um, well, I was usually on the other side, so I'll Would stick you do that. The Crucible? No, I did, no? Uh, we, 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 put on, we put on Dracula, though. Um, but I was doing, you know, I always stayed behind. I was building the trees. <laughs> okay, well, that's good, because we, I was about to ask you about your start in cinema was with, after college, you worked with Roland Emmerich. Uh, I did, yeah. In his art department. Yes, and I, I was, well, I, was, I, started, um, I started as a storyboard artist storyboard and, and, artist. and met and kind of found my way to um, uh, uh, Roland's, Roland's um, film Stargate was the first like, official movie that I worked on. And, um, and it was through, I just, um, I was trying everything I possibly could to just uh, use my just artwork or anything that I'd done in, in, um, in college to, 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 try to, get, to try to get in. And, and it kind of snuck my way in. And you worked on Stargate, and you worked on quite a few other of his blockbusters. They are blockbusters. They are, yeah. We was uh, Stargate, and um, and then Independence Day, Godzilla, um, and um, and then a few of the Barry Sonnenfeld's films as well, uh, Men in Black and Wild Wild West. And and what did you What do you learn in that kind of situation? You're uh, you want to make films yourself. You've spent your teenage years reading comic books. You're interested in science fiction. Superheroes. I mean, with cinema. with uh, honestly, what was because I was I I enrolled in I, I was in film school for um, a few months when I when I because I was also I was I've been trying to get into the movie business and and make movies since I was about eleven years old so I was already on a you know on a path of everything I could possibly do and so when um, I enrolled in school and I was I was doing a student film there and um, and through a very long boring story. Uh, found my way to, to an official movie, to Stargate. And so I packed up and, and, and went, uh, went out there. And I was, and I was, uh, I was just trying to, um, kind of, because I could draw, mm. I was trying to use that as much as possible. Anytime that I could trip over somebody, ooh, sorry, here's my, here's my portfolio and here's my drawings. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so with the, the, the prop master had seen a lot of my artwork and, mm. and wanted me to design some props and do things. And, and so um, uh, that's what I did for a lot of those movies. And with w being on Roland's set, what was great is that it's one at that time he, he was doing a lot of model work, and um, before he got into a lot of the the the, uh, the the CG work, and and it was a it was my own kind of film school to be on set. It was actually the, the it's um, it, it, you, there's nothing like being on set to be able to actually just if you're really paying attention and really trying to to get a sense of how how it operates. And um, I was told, from, and I forget what what director that I had met. Um, or, or heard that he said anybody can direct a movie. It's it's those who can direct a movie under circumstances because there's there's always circumstances, and it seems like at any given day it's really just somebody telling you you can't have that, you can't do that. The crane broke down. We don't have enough money. How do you, you know you want these these five shots? You can do it in one, and so it's constant constant um, problems. And so because that was something that I was I, I was aware of. What I would do on Roland sets, Barry Sonnenfeld sets, and and such is hang around the video village and of course there'd be problems every five minutes that would that would pop up and i'd hang out by the monitor and i would just think okay this if this was my problem what what would i do and what how would i solve this problem i would just quietly sit there my prop belt and whittling away on whatever th thing i was i was trying to do and so i would come up with a solution and see then what their solution was and um it was a great form of of, of film school that way yeah so you mentioned you were 11 years old when you started why, with this idea that you might want to make films, what kind of films were you watching at the time? What kind of books were you reading? What kind of mindset did you have? I was like, you know, I was 11, so yeah. I was, you know, I was, um, uh, there were a lot of, I was influenced by the movies of that time. I was everything from... Uh, Spielberg, Lucas. Spielberg, Lucas, Cameron, and, and uh, you know, Luc Besson. And, um, and, but, but I'll tell you, the, the one, um, you know, defining moment I actually do have one. I remember being um, at my grandmother's house and, and like laying on the ground there and, and, and watching. Uh, she showed me Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And uh, would you any of you guys like this? <laughs> <laughs> Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yeah. yeah, and I just I remember just just watching that and going, wow, it's just I was so captivated by it. I loved it. And something at that that age, um, I just thought that. that I want to be doing that. And I was just at that time getting a sense that somebody actually was in control of making movies rather than movies just were. 
Um, I remember at, at one point around that same time that I had, my grandmother had shown me that, I, uh, I, I loved the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was one of the, you know, again, yeah. I was right at that right age where, you know, um, and it's, honestly, I th- it's actually still, I think it's one of the, um, the, the first Indiana Jones movie is, is such a good combination of romance and drama, action, thriller. It's, 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 it's really done well, in my opinion. And, and I was such a fan of that. Um, and I rented with a buddy of mine what I thought was Rare's Lost Ark, um, which we were surprised was out on video so early. Yeah. Came home, put it in. Of course, it's not out on video. It was the makings of, which I'd never seen in, in my life. I, I didn't, I'd never seen a makings of, of, of anything. And just seeing somebody that, that, that hero that I really liked, there was this other guy that was going, and he was like, you know, just pointing around at everybody. I said, who is that guy? What is he doing? And I, I want that job. And, uh, that was Spielberg. That was Spielberg, yeah. And I remember at the time just thinking, that looks easy, too. That doesn't, he just, <laughs> he's just pointing at everybody. And so immediately it was in my backyard making an Indiana Jones movie at probably age 11 or so. Yeah. And then and it just kept it. I was, I feel like that's all I've been doing. I, I've been making movies since I was that age. And, um, you know, and then I would get my, my, my parents were very supportive. I've turned every bedroom into a set, turned a garage, uh, you know, to a little studio in the back when, you know, all through high school. And uh, my dad helped me out with, I was really trying to progress. I would watch them. I mean, and the minute that I saw the Indiana Jones behind the scenes, I was looking for every single kind of behind the scenes possible. And, um, you know, right down to the the way they do the, the 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 squib hits for gunshots and things. Again, I was 11, so it was um, uh, you know trying to find a way to work that. My dad would help me uh, put together like a, a car battery that he'd hook up to a wire, like a, with a rocket igniter, to put into a firecracker. You put it up into your shirt, and you put it to a nail board. So you could, you know, because I saw they were doing some that special. Incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous. Well, the first one that we actually put together. Of course, because I had watched everything. So how, they, how they're doing that, I showed my dad. My, my dad's a, a, a mechanic, so um, I was like, well, let's, let's put this together. I didn't put the padding over the... I had the metal strap. I was like, I'm going to be smart enough to put a strap of metal that you put it's around your barrier chest. Barrier between explosives barrier, and bare skin. Barrier between the, the bare skin and the explosive, but not necessarily a padding beneath that. So once you explode on a on bed, it just heats up the metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I have my, my buddy who, I didn't do it. Um, you know, so I've got my buddy, I'm like, I, I still have, I love the shot, because it was, he's just sitting there, and he's, he's doing one of these, he's looking away, we're like, one, two, and then it pops, and we're like, yeah, because it had the blood pack in it and everything, it looked pretty good. Wait about, like, 15 seconds, he goes, whoo, whoo, whoo. He's going, and, and it, it was strapped to his chest. Uh, so you learn. Yes. <laughs> So you're reading comic books, you're reading science fiction at the time as a young man, and this, that kind of genre cinema is what you're interested in. Were you reading Philip K. Dick books, not perhaps at such a young age, but were you interested in Dick and the kind of movies that they were making from his work? Do you know, I, was, I wasn't introduced to, uh, to his work until I was in college. I, you know, like I'd, I'd seen Total Recall when I was, when I was you know, 14. Yeah. 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 And... Um, you know, honestly, I saw it as, as the next Arnold movie. It was really seeing the next Arnold action film than anything. I wasn't aware of Philip K. Dick. I wasn't aware of really, I wasn't looking for the sci-fi themes or, or um, anything, uh, you, know, p- you know, politically. I, w- I, was, I was literally just going to see Arnold. And, um, and it wasn't until college that I started reading uh, Philip K. Dick stuff and, and actually getting involved in, um, in sci-fi more in a different way. And I actually remember when reading that story, I think, oh, that's right, that's that movie with, with, with Arnold. And... And um, you know, found it to be very different too, and it just like in, it, in its tone when I read when I read that, and um, and s- yeah, I, I mean, I've I'm not specifically just uh, you know into science fiction, but yeah. um, but it is it is a, a true love though of mine, and I, I just I, much more than even fantasy. I'm I, I do there's the difference to me is just that I mean science fiction just by, by nature I guess is it's it's the extension of science. Um, it's always coming from from our own reality, or, or usually it is that it's the it's the what if you know if uh, whether politically, uh, scientifically, um, uh, you know, or even techn- you know technologically, if you know what if we were to reach this point. Yeah, it's speculative, speculative. Figure. Yeah, and often um, I think because we just often it's it's the what if in the in the bad scenario. You know, s- sci-fi has quite a um, you know a very a very popular and present paranoia element to a lot of the, the, the sci-fi stories that, that we love. And so 
I think one is good for storytelling in terms of there has to be conflict, so you want to you know see where that um, uh, you know how how that plays out. But um, yeah, and that's why that's why I like it. I've I've been sent a lot of fantasy stuff, and particularly it's after the Underworld series, yeah. Particularly, I, yeah. Before Vampire sparkled. Before they sparkled, you know. And what's funny is that like I don't know. I won't. This is a uh, you know. Um, it's funny because the I, I'm I've been I, it's so everywhere I go. I'm accused of of copying Twilight. Yeah, Which I think I think we made the first underworld pain. before Kristen Stewart was born. I honestly, <laughs> um, but it's uh, uh, yeah, and it was. But even that, like that was, I'm. I never thought that I would start my career with a with a werewolf movie by by any stretch of the imagination. I was um, looking for an opportunity. I re really wanted to direct, and it, that was a situation with um, Dimension Films had seen my reel, and I had done music videos and commercials, and, commercials and yeah. such. Yeah, and. I had a certain style, I guess, to, to, to those, and they thought that it would work great for, they wanted to do a, just a werewolf movie. And so they came to me and said, you know, are you, you interested in developing this really low budget werewolf movie? I said, absolutely not, not interested at all. Um, but I, I, you know, as I, I could do that and take that opportunity, or I put the prop belt back on and go, and I was, I was, I was working on, uh, I forget, so I think it was Men in, I was just about to start Men in Black 2. Um, and I said, no, no, I got to pass on this. And then and I was going back to work. I'm like, I, I may not get this opportunity again. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really serious. And, and so I went back and thought, how would I do a werewolf movie that I would get interested in? Because I'm not a big horror fan. Um, and so in trying to find a different type of werewolf movie the, the, uh, and, and what kind of opponent has not been done before, it led me to vampires. And putting those two together, then I started to get interested. Then it was, you know, Romeo and Juliet and the Capulets and the, you know, Montagues and, and, and how that might be twisted in this kind of reality um, or fantasy. And um, put it all together, did elaborate drawings. I did all my own artwork for about three months, just sat and did a, and pitched it to them. They hated it. Uh, they, they, they wanted strictly a, just a werewolf, strict werewolf. They already had a yeah. vampire franchise. Um, but the uh, the agent that I was with liked it enough, so just just keep taking it around. And so I know you've directed two, and you've produced four Underworld in yes. the Underworld franchise. Yeah, and the Underworld. Series. You're not going to do another one, are you? No, and I'm I I'm not, I seem like I should be the right person to ask, but I'm not. I said there wasn't going to be a fourth one, so don't ask me. Yeah. I I, uh, I I had already, and that's part of the reason that is because I I had planned out the first when I when I kind of created that whole structure and, and timeline. I'd always pictured it being a, a trilogy. Well, actually, with the, one of the writers I was working with, we mapped out a, a, you know, a long timeline um, and actually then chose, well, what is the, the best first movie? was actually the cheapest first movie, actually, as well, to put together that, that I could possibly go around and pitch, pitch to do. Now, back to Dick. The, when it comes to adapting the original short story, we can remember it for your wholesale. It's quite comp it, all of Dick's work is quite complex mm. and complicated. How do you map out a screenplay from that? Or it, Verhoeven's original film from 1992, I think it was 1993. Well, yeah, yeah. Were you watching that, and it, did you want a strict remake, or did you want to go back to the source material? I it, it was it, kind of a weird way into it because I was I wasn't part of the developing uh, you know part of uh, develop, developing the script from from the start. So it actually came to me completely left field. I was I was involved in, I was very close to shooting another movie that I'd been working on for like seven months, so I was in a cave, and um, the money didn't come through, and, uh, and then this, they, they, uh, they sent me Total Recall, which I had no idea was even being developed, so by the time that I got it, I guess that's a long way to say, it, it was, there were many things that were already mapped decided, out and decided, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kurt Wimmer had, had written that draft, he'd already yeah. foregone the, uh, you know, the idea of Mars, yeah, and, Mars um, gone, yeah. and kind of folded the, the Laurie character, in the movie, there, like, Laurie, there's uh, Laurie and Richter, and he had decided to fold those characters together and expand Laurie's character so that, uh, you know, we're just in a day and age where, you know, when the shit really hits the fan and things go wrong, why do you have to call in the right-hand man? Why not have the right-hand man be a woman? Mm -hmm. And just, you know, it's, it's her job. If things go wrong, she's got to clean it up. And so there's a lot of things that he had already put into there, the, the fall traveling through the, mm -hmm. the core of the earth. But what he did... What he did want to do, though, is, is uh, and I was, that's what got me very interested when I was reading, because things like the, the Mars aspect and, um, and such that, it sounds weird, maybe, as I, I was more reading the script to convince myself why not to do it, and, um, 
Maybe that's why I haven't made that many movies because that's how I go about reading a lot of scripts. It's two years of your life, you know, so you, you do look at things with, with a lot of, um, you know, I was very interested in what they were doing with it, but ultimately I just also done the, the Die Hard movie, which I started my career, I love to create my own worlds and my, and, and my own material. And I just kind of, you know, you, you try to kind of plot out your course and then everything else says, no, you're going over here. And I, I wasn't really into doing a, 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 a remake or just a, a known title. Yeah. And, um, and so I was more trying to convince myself why I wouldn't do it. I was reading it, and when I found that it, that it, it wasn't going to Mars, it was shocking, but then at the same time, I was now left with, I have no idea where this is going, in a very good way, because it's not the same journey. It's not, and I, just got, and I, I, was, I was hooked. Um, and also by the, the tone of it, when I read the, sto the story in college, I had a very different reaction and, and, and kind of, just what, what came to mind when I was reading the, the short story versus when I saw the, the original as a kid. Mm -hmm. And a very different tone of Quaid as well. And this story had that, closer to that vision of Quaid. So you're talking about an every day blue collar, you know, a working man. Yeah, that's, he was that's somebody. That's written, whereas Arnie is a muscle man, he's a super spy right from the start. He's you a, never, and that, and you that's, never buy that's him really, as an ordinary guy, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that was really what some, that, um, <laughs> In the in the in the in the short story, it's very much somebody that you feel that could be you, and that you connect with, and um, and that you know it's, it's such a great wish fulfillment story. And at the at the heart of it, it's um, that that's that's what it is. And so to be able to play out that you know the the unhappy everyman who then turns into a super spy rather than starting with somebody that we're all kind of familiar with. Yeah. A super spy, just you're more waiting for him to be activated. You know, when are they going to turn Arnold Schwarzenegger on um, versus somebody that actually has a transformation? Yeah. Well, that's an interesting take, uh, it's particularly on the source material because it's kind of melancholy and it's about identity and the individual. And if you can mess with your mind, then what, what part of your identity do you have left? I think that comes across very strongly in the film with Farrell. What do you think of the theory that from the moment, uh, and this is coming from Verhoeven's original film as well, that from the moment he's injected or from the moment he sits in the seat, everything else we see from that point on is, is the fantasy. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Or is it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's, the, that's the whole yeah. idea. What are we actually watching? I think it throws up interesting questions about the narrative, you know. And it does, and it's actually, it's, um, but I, I, I love that. As, you know, encased in all the, yeah, there's, there's, so many other things going on with it. It's a massive world, uh, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, so it's kind of a relentless, uh, you know, kind of chase structure of a movie. Um, but what I really loved about it is that I, I also, when, it's, when saying that I, I love things, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, other genres than, than science fiction, that mm -hmm. I, I really love a, a really good thriller. And, um, and this struck me at its core that it is, it's, it's ultimately a detective story. Mm -hmm. And that in, in, a, in, in such a twisted way where he is, He's both the detective and the suspect that he is detecting. He's, you know, it's he's a detective, and his case is his own soul, and he's trying to figure out who he is, and if he is essentially, you know, if if he is a good guy or bad guy, and those those, and that that's a very, um, it's a it would be a terrible dilemma, but it's a really fun one to yeah. to tell in a, in a story, and so that I, I and I hope if we did our job correctly, it's it's uh, that it it, it has this. Um, Almost this, this, this really, you know, it's, it's a fast pace, almost like, I, I pitched it to the studio to them get a sense of what I was seeing with it, because you always have to use an example of something that's out there, or you'll never get uh, people to understand where, where your movie's going. Yeah. But in terms of, this is like, um, in terms of its structure or how it's going to map out that, but I was saying, it's, it's like, a uh, like a, a futuristic version of The Fugitive. Okay. In the sense that, you know, now when you have Harrison Ford is... Once um, he starts running, he keeps running. Yeah. It, it's a pursuit. It's a, pers it's a pursuit structure. And yet, during that pursuit, what he's trying to do is he's trying to prove his own innocence. Whereas our character is trying to kind of prove his, his existence, really, yeah, yeah. Um, throughout the course of it. It's really interesting. The, but the first thing I noticed when I sat down in front of Total Recall was that it's in glorious, fabulous 2D. Yes, it is. Were you tempted at any point to turn it into a 3D film, and what do you think of the 3D film? I, I, was, I, was, uh, I wasn't tempted, I was, um, uh, I'm just, I, I was, it was suggested over and over and over. Um, it, I was the only one that wasn't into the idea of 3D, and I think it's, it's, it's actually really difficult to get a movie of a certain size, especially in the summer, 
uh, event movie, whatever you call it, that is that's not that's in not 3D. 3D. Yeah. And I just, um, for many reasons, I, I I'm not I'm not I'm not wildly against 3D. I, I've um, you know, I I thought Avatar was was fantastic. It's also a very different kind of movie than you know. It's it's also uh, essentially I mean it's it's about 90% CG, which I think it's actually an works. Really, yeah. yeah, which works really well in 3D. I also think the Pixar movies are fantastic in yeah. 3D. Um, but as a live action, and especially for this movie, I the tone of it, I wanted a more realistic take, a more realistic uh, depiction of the future. And by, by putting 3D on top of it, it just felt like it was pushing it too far, that it yeah. would almost make it overtly futuristic, slightly more of a video game. I still have a disconnect with 3D. I'm also, I consider myself, and I, 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 or, or just in terms of what I like, but the combination of a, like a very old school style with the, you know using a lot of updated technology, but the 3D one is just too drastic for me. It just, I'm still aware of if any time during a movie, even if it's twice during a movie, that I'm going like this, and going hmm, you know, and, it, and I'm I'm coming out of the story for a second, yeah. and I still find visually it's it's still there's a, a contrast problem. I really love very dark visuals. I, I like dark. Blacks and and very bright, uh, you know, so that you can have a very dark image, but you can really see still what's going on. 3D is still very dim to me. Yeah, I was just about to ask you that uh, a lot of your uh, a lot of your action takes place in the rain and in the dark. And uh, if you put glasses on and f on top of that, you're going to lose that 10%. You, you the film will be virtually invisible. Yeah. yeah, and I've done tests, and they had. I mean, there was so much pressure to do it in 3D. And I, the, the the good thing I'm glad I, is that I didn't go in doing. Well, I'm not sure. I, I just said if it's 3D, then I'm then I'm, I'm out. But you mentioned your interest in uh, practical special effects. Uh, you built a lot of sets for this film rather than do them digitally. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's where the old school part comes in, I guess. I, you know, in growing up and also, you know, I was in the art department, so I was in, in various stages of of uh, the art department was building props or sets or, you know, um, and and so that's what I did. I would I would design, then build, and and I like I like doing that, um, and I like to be able to put it on set, shoot it. It's also just I think to be a director, you have to. There's some, you know, you're 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 a, a micromanager to some extent. And and so it allows me to actually control and 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 you know if once I capture it on film it's it's done. Yeah. Rather than take here's a visual yeah. effect that you're going to send off to 200 other people um, and supervise it through you know whether it's Skype or, you know whether your company yeah, yeah. is or you know going in and it's just um, and then I think that the the response that people have to um, to a CG. I mean, there's a lot of CG in this movie, but it's a very different. It's all. It's it's. There's also, it's the biggest biggest visual effects movie I've ever done. You have something like 1,700 effects. Shows there's yes, yeah, so there's 17 or 18, um, uh, and uh, but, but you it's also, also the have tactile, practical sets. You know that. Which is more complicated to build a massive set and have actors chase? Oh, I think I think the practical or is. I think the the, the visual yeah. effects are. I don't I don't think it's more complicated. I think it's um. It's a, it's definitely a longer process, visual effects wise. Just a visual effects takes takes forever. Um, but there's it, to work something out practically, you have to work it out within the pressure of shooting that day. There's a big difference. If something doesn't work in a visual effect, you know, you, know, you can mull over it and you you know and you, you stress about it. But they go back, they work on it. But on set, I understand why a lot of stuff is swapped out and they go CG. If you're trying to, you know, we had a hover car chase that we shot, and I think everybody thought I was crazy because I. I sat down with the production team and said, how do you want to do this? I said, well, I want to shoot it like a car chase. I want to build seven hover cars and go out there and shoot it like I would a, a, a car chase on Die Hard or something. And, um, you know, we're going to build these cars on top of other cars that, that we'll race around, make it look like they're floating, then we'll paint out the cars, put in the city in the background. To Is make this that... what you actually did? Because oh, oh, yeah. that sounds crazy. Oh, it does. And it, the computer guy could come in and say, we can do that with the stroke of a mouse. Well, and, also, and this is what happened. We'd sit down with all the visual effects companies, and I would interview them. We'd talk about the certain scenes. I'd show them the, show them the, the previs or the, the, you know, the, the kind of animated storyboards. And, um, and everybody was like, well, why don't you just, I don't understand, Len. What do you, why don't you just do this in CG? We have so much more control. You don't have, you have, you have, you know, there's, there's no limitations if you do it in, in, in CG. And I go, Ah, but that's the problem. You know, it's like I, 
I invite limitations. I don't think limitations is a bad thing. Limitations to me is is part of filmmaking. It's part of m mechanics and making things making things look like like a movie. Um, to me, in my opinion, so uh, you know when you take away those limitations, I'm saying I, part of the reason why I'm doing it practically is so that you guys actually have limitations. You have the limitations of what we shot on set, and not to be a dick about it, but I'm not, I'm not trying to get as I, I love. You know, I, when I when I am with the visual effects team, um, you know, I think the the company that we had, uh, Digital Negative, is it did a, a, a brilliant job. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. But I, I but it needs for me, it needs to come from a practical place. And so we did these cars so that all the camera movements, all the imperfections of everything, and all the limitations that you have, they're then uh, you know they're a slave to that footage that I've shot rather yeah, than the reverse. Yeah. And I just disconnect when I when. You know, in, in the freedom of CG, and then you're going through a city, and you're traveling through, you go through this little thing right here, and you come around, and, you just, and um, I'm too aware that we're looking into a CG world then. And, and It takes you out of the picture. It, it, it takes me out of the picture. Yeah. I, I think there's a, even within, you know, an action or a tense, if you're trying to build something that's really tense, I do think that there's a difference between even a very, a really good visual effect versus a really good practical effect. I think you watch the visual effect, and you can go, Wow, that's that's a really. I mean, that 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 effect was really cool. Mm. You'll get maybe that. You'll get wow, that was really cool. But you won't get holy shit. Yeah, what just happened? Dangerous. That yeah, looks yeah, dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The danger quality. The the where you may, maybe go oh, and you get a little bit tense. Like wow, did they really do that? Did he really fall off of that thing? Did he, um, when it's when it's visual effects, you I think you kind of sit there and you take it in. Um, my opinion. Tell me a little bit. We're going to talk about casting and casting Colin Farrell, Kate Beckinsale, and uh, Jessica Biel in a moment, but. Tell me a little bit about uh, uh, working with actors in that kind of environment, in a, a special effects heavy environment, where visually it's very, very important that you capture what you're set out to capture, but you also have living, breathing actors in the middle of that, how, uh, how, you re how they research, how they work in terms of training with firearms, and, uh, martial arts, and whatever it might be. Uh, tell me an insight into that. I mean, one of the, again, this kind of goes to the practical, like, you know, just, just uh, the old, old school way of shooting and just that's it. You, you have a set, you create as much as you can. So for the visual effects side and with the actors, that's, that's just, it's um, part of what helps them is what helps me, is that if we're sitting here, with it, that I don't ever like to be in a discussion where I say, okay, now this thing, that thing that you're holding right there, that green thing yeah. that you're holding, that's, that's, that's going to be this and this. That's going to be a kind of thing that flaps over. This right here, pretend this is something, and then that tennis ball and what you're sitting on right here, that I will never do. I, I, yeah. So everything around the actors is going to be real anyway. Yeah. So that really all I'm doing is saying, out there, outside that window where that's green, that'll, that's that'll just be a city. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and really try to, so that everything that they're interacting with can be, can be real. So that's something that just from a... Uh, it makes a it a lot easier point. for them, obviously. Yeah, yeah and it's um, I, I, d definitely for, for them, it helps me uh, you know, as well to... Um, uh, you know, so it's, uh, that's, all, that's all very helpful. And then, um, you know, this movie was very... I found it the most challenging in terms of working with the actors with um, the fact that there were two stories, or not two stories, but two realities that were having to exist at the same time. And so you get in these inter interesting conversations where, say, Laurie, uh, his friend Harry, um, and the others that I really wanted the movie to add up to where you could go back and make the argument you, you go through and it's uh, that uh, this is all taking place as, as his fantasy. And then an argue, argument that it's that it's real and it's part of Philip K. Dick's story, which makes it brilliant and it's 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 open ended. And uh, but I didn't want to cheat it too much. I really wanted to be able to go through and you can see that it, it does exist on both both layers. Well, that means for the actors and the director with the actor of just in all the little details of performance. Well, how good of an actor am I mm. in in as the friend? Am I such a good if in the version where I am an agent? In the version where I'm not really the friend, how good of a friend do I come across as an actor? Do yeah. am I so so great that you don't see through the cracks, or is that little little bit of fakeness come through to where I seem suspect? Yeah, yeah. Um, which may just come across though as bad acting. Um, you know, so there's a lot of those how little. How do you balance that? It's it was really it was really tough because you you want to. Um, I was. I was saying, look, it's it's uh, you know, you guys are chosen for uh, for your ability, and and uh, I, I so I wanted them to play it as real as possible in terms of their performance of of their 
uh, you know, assignment in the version where they are the agent, um, they're very skilled. They're, and, um, you know, so, but it's, it's just a conversation you go through that you don't really realize when you're approaching a movie like this that you'll find yourself in conversations of, mm. uh, I never have had discussions with my actors where they say, how good do you want me to act? <laughs> you know, should I, should I dial it down a little bit and be more fake, uh, you know? Was Colin involved in the film before you arrived, or did you, were you involved in casting? No, I, I chose Colin. Um, actually, kind of right when I was done reading. I, I'm, I'm the, you know, some people say, well, I don't find the character until you go through. And um, I, I started picturing somebody in my, in my mind uh, when I was reading. And, you know, I'd seen a lot of Colin's, Colin's work, and he's, mm-hmm. he's, uh, he's, he's it, I got such a, um, it's a, a really, uh, uh, you know, just a, a, a whole mix of, um, of whether it's different genres and different characters that it's really nice as a director to be able to look at work that an actor's done and not that you're going to pick and choose and then say this is the character mm-hmm. but as a starting point of conversation say I see a little bit of Quaid like in, in, in Bruges in this character a little bit of, uh, you know, from Phone Booth and a little, and, um, and know that he has access to that, that range. Broad range, yeah. And he just has a um, Quaid to me, the, the Quaid is again going back to the wish fulfillment story. I really want somebody that felt like they were vulnerable and somebody that you felt sympathetic towards. But then when they did become the super spy, that they had enough, like of a just a, a, a dangerous, you know, toughness quality to him. Mm-hmm. And I do think that Colin, unlike a lot of other actors, it's a hard thing to find of somebody that does have a you know a very vulnerable and sympathetic. Uh, you know, appeal about them, but then you know, also be a, nails, somebody yeah. that if, if pushing a corner will will you know will kick your ass and go a bit wild. Yeah. So um, so that worked with the kind of two two layers of this of this character. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so okay, let's find out where we are here. Total yeah. Recall two. Yesterday you told people in a web forum. I read your web forum, your web chat. My web chat. You did a web chat. Oh, okay. I don't yeah, understand yeah, those things at all. So I, yeah, okay. Uh, that there's a longer version of this film out there somewhere. There's a longer version that, yeah, I was, um, I think, it's, uh, like, it's uh, 17 minutes longer. It's my director's cut that, um, it's just a, I, you know, the reason why I wanted to do this movie was the, um, I, in, in fact, the main scene in the, when I read the script was the, in the, the lobby scene where his friend comes back in and sets the stage again about whether or not this is, this is you know, he, that he's telling him that it's all, it's all a fantasy. It's a great, like, really tense courtroom battle where, uh, you know, his, his mind is on trial. And I, I love that idea of it. And so there's scenes like that that deal with it that I just are, you know, they're, they're di- diving a little bit deeper into those that, some may find repetitive I, or boring. I find it fascinating. It's, it's the stuff that I really, I really like. So, um, so it, it's, it's a chance to be able to, you know, to, uh, to ha- have, that, have that out there. And then some other scenes that I had tried, I've, is this, as I've gone on, um, I, I've become more of a believer that you make your movie three times and that it, you really are, you're making it in script and, and, pro- and production and then in post. And because of that, I've, I've learned or tried or to, um, to use production as you're really just grabbing all of your materials. And if anything comes up that you want to try and experiment with, um, then, then you do it because you never know what you're going to want to you know, right. put together. And, um, and so a few things that I had tried during production that weren't even in the script um, that I just you know, get, get my head you know, really into this, um, I- into this whole concept and, and the idea of recall and what it would really do. Ideas would come up that aren't in the script that I, that I wanted to try, and the studio was was very, um, you know, cool about uh, ha- allowing me to do these things as long as I just stayed on schedule. And I've been in that boat before where I have too much to shoot, um, and uh, so you just have a second camera going for a whole different setup. And so I brought in, I did a few of these scenes that I just wanted to try, and some of them made the final cut, and some of them didn't, and so those scenes uh, I'll be able to put back in as well. But what do you think then of the notion that a director can, nowadays, can constantly play with a film and release films through video on demand or Blu-ray special releases and things like that? What do you think? When is your job? When do you finally say, 17 minutes, and that's it, not another minute? And then, like Ridley Scott, perhaps, two years later, say, 
I found another five minutes. <laughs> yeah, no. I, really I understand like that. I completely get it. I, I still, you know, you, you, you watch a movie, you go, oh my God, that shot. Why? You know, it's like, I've, I, I don't know if I would ever go back and, and keep going. But I, um, I understand because you're so passionate about it. It's something you live with. It's your life for, for sometimes two, three years. Um, but you had a whole character played by a well-known actor. Did I did. I too. Yeah. Well, the other actor is not very well known, so that's not really talked about. But, um, but yeah, Ethan Hawke um, was somebody that that wanted to want to work with him for a, while, a long time. And this was an idea that I wanted to try out. And it was only a day. I said, just do me a favor and, oh, okay. and yeah. come in and 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 try this um, this this angle on it uh, that may really kind of just be a fun um, like a, a, a kind of a you know another layer plot to it. Um, and I really liked it, and so that would be on the DVD as well. It was, it was possibly, maybe it confused people too much, or it was, you know, I, I embrace confusion. Uh, studios hate to hear that, but I think there's a difference between good confusion and bad confusion. You know, good confusion is just mystery to me, and as long as you are making sense of it at the end of the day, um, traveling along on a movie like this, if you're, if you're confused for a little while and scratching your head, so what? Um, you know, as long as it actually comes to, you know, uh, you know, comes into clarity down the road, I'm all for it. Um, so there's that, and then there's a really brilliant actor, a really good um, performance with a, a um, an actor from Toronto as well. The scene that, again, that I shot two versions of it. I wanted to try for, try this one, and um, and that'll that'll make it too. So it's a lot of. On Die Hard, there were a lot of things that came up just organically through production, mm -hmm. and a lot of Justin Long and I. Justin Long is very funny. We'd sit outside, and, and we had the script that some of us, honestly, we didn't like, and so we would we, we'd rewrite and go through some you know some ideas, and we'd try those. We had to shoot the other ones because it's much easier with a studio rather than try to take all of the conversations. At least for me, all the conversations and all the headache of trying to do this shot versus this shot, or not this shot, this scene versus this scene, if you can find a way in your schedule that you know that you could do, you can do both, then you just, you just, you cut through it much faster. And also it was my first studio film, so it was the conversations I would have to have are longer than, than others, I guess. Um, so I would just haul ass, shoot two scenes, and with, where, where Die Hard's considered a lot of those scenes that I just tried on my own were the ones that went into the film. Mm. You know, and so, uh, I hope I, I, as I go in my career, I don't have to do that as much, but... Now, I'm going to open the questions to the floor in just a moment, but I have one f last question, which is, what advice would you give to a younger or an up-and-coming filmmaker who's interested in telling the same kind of stories that you tell, but doesn't have the budget, and perhaps doesn't have the special effects technologies that you have access to? What kind of advice would you give them uh, to allow them to realize their film? I, I think it's a, it, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any, any budget either, and I've, I've been into the kind of films that I'm into, and I think it's, um, honestly, it's as simple as just to, to, to just start shooting anything, to just, once you shoot something and put something together, it'd be as, 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 as cheesy and low rent and, and down and dirty as possible, and then what you do is you learn from that one, and what you did, just go through the process, and then you do it again. You do it again. You try to pull other, you know, other resources and just keep shooting. And and uh, you know, I grew up with none, none of my family is in the business, and my, you know, so we and I, we didn't have a lot of money. And you know, I'd go in the backyard and just do whatever I could with a video camera. Um, and nowadays, it's so. I, I'm actually, I would love to be making those movies today where. I was just begging for anybody to watch anything I did. Yeah. And now you've, you know, there's people who put together a, a short film and it shows up on a lot of the, you know, a lot of the fan sites. It shows up on YouTube and, you know, there's, there is a place to actually get, get the material noticed. I, I was down to, I grew up in San Francisco and the only hub of any kind of industry there was, was Lucasfilm and ILM. And I remember at, at that time I, um, it was just a whole different world. I, I had, uh, um, an opportunity to, to go to a sound seminar with a with a friend of mine, and so I knew I was going to be traveling through the gates of Lucasfilm at one point. Dude, that's exciting! And like that's this is my chance. Yeah, yeah. This is it. And I was 18, and um, so I gathered together the VHS reels that I had of student films, of stop motion Your action figures, shot, whatever. Yeah. My friend getting shot, going, "Oh God!" And um, and I put like 12 of these VHS tapes together in a Ziploc bag, 
And as we drove through the gates, I rolled down the windows and I just started chucking out these reels like a paper route. <laughs> all, all, and, and just thinking, at some point when George Lucas is mowing his lawn, <laughs> he'll, he'll go down and go like, what is this? And, and it, now that's, that's really clever. Look, yeah. at, look at that. And call me up. And, and I really, at that time though, I thought, well, this is it. I've heard stories like this. This is like how this. you get a break this is how I got it. And you know what? And honestly, part of it is the way that I actually really did get my first job, I had heard from, I think it was some behind the scenes that I was watching with Spielberg and him talking about walking onto the Universal lot. Have we all heard this story? Yeah. About how he set up an office and just put his name on it and whatever. Whether it's true or not, I have no idea. I don't, I know don't if, think it's true. I don't know if I heard it. It's a good story. It is a good story. And so he's, he said that he just kind of walked around as a crew member and immediately. So I'm like, there we go. That's what I'm doing. And I was in the Bay Area. They were shooting this movie called Heart, Heart and Souls. Heart and Souls with Robert Downey Jr. Um, it's quite a good movie. Okay. Yeah. Check it. It's, and so anyway, they were, they were shooting in San Francisco. And it's all cordoned off and blocked off. And you've got your, you know, all these people. I didn't know exactly what they did. Um, and so I drove by one day. I saw what some of the crew members looked like. like okay, they're wearing shorts. They got a walkie-talkie. <laughs> They've got like they're carrying shit around. And I was told, you know, if you just walk onto a set with an extension cord or a clipboard or something, and look don't busy. and don't ask anybody yeah. where to go or look, what to look do, look like you know what you're look doing. Look what you yeah. like, look like you know what you're doing. I, okay, so I did exactly that. Got the shorts on, got the boots, got a got a walkie-talkie. I grabbed an extension cord. How long did you last? I I got a job. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> so I actually just walked right on, <coughs> and um. And just had an extension cord in my hand. It's amazing. This extension cord got me into the place that I am today. And it's like, like that's it's how you, you know, so I, I just walked right in. Nobody asked me a thing. And then I just started going about and um, I made sure that I had my portfolio just, just happened to be on me as well. And I did that. And I met the prop master there and just started talking to him and, um, and eventually led me to another movie that he was going to. And that's, that's the first one that I, that I worked on. Thank you, Len. <laughs> I'd like to thank Len Wiseman. First of all, we are going to have some questions from the floor, but I want to thank Len for coming to see us this morning. Absolutely. I want to thank the Irish Film and Television Academy, you the members. I want to thank Sony Pictures and say thanks, Len, and good luck with the film. Thank you. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Gentlemen, first row. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, well, I don't think it was just the clipboard uh, and the uh, and the extension cord that got you in, because uh, clearly, you know, you 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 had that portfolio and uh, it's shown through the years. I guess I've got two questions. Um, you know, one is, uh, do you still get to do your own artwork? Um, yeah. And and you, you started as a props guy and 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 came through all those movies as a props guy. Do you still get to kind of make and design your own gadgets? Because you talked about the limitations um, in the practical sets and and one of the things I love about the movie is that you really do get a sense of the limitations of the world mm -hmm. so I'm interested to hear you talk about the gadgets and uh, art yeah I'm, I'm still I still draw quite a bit not as much as I I, I, w I would like to and it's um it's actually uh, you know I, I walk into art department now because you have everybody that will draw for you and that's what I started you know uh, and, and I really do love to draw and so um, you know, I'll walk into art department now and see all the work there. And actually, a part of me honestly sinks a little bit because I love doing that and I don't get to do that anymore. Um, and so, but part of it, I still do draw the initial phase stuff. So I am, um, it's also the only way that I, I know how. Everybody finds their way of, of how to communicate with, with the art department, with the look of the movie. Instead of describing what I want with my production team, I sit there with a stack of paper. And they say, well, what are you looking for for this? Or wardrobe or, you know, and I'll, I, you know, cause sketch it up fairly, fairly fast, which thank God for me, because I, 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 it's, it's the way that I communicate with all of that. So I'll send them pictures for, for everything. And, um, and so I, I it's, it's part of, that's the part of the, the kid in me who is still working, doing, building stuff in the garage, is still building stuff today. I love all the, like, the cell phone implant stuff, the, the shrapnel oh, camera with all the, you know, the cam that's, those are ideas that, that honestly, I just, steal from myself from other projects that I was trying to work on that, um, you know, an idea is an idea, you know, as long as it's your idea. Um, little gadgets like that and things that, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always, you know, and, and trying to, like you said, with limitations of something that, uh, that still feels like just, like it has a real base to it. Um, but I, I love this. I'm very involved in it almost 
too much probably. If you talk to my, I make a deal with the, like the the art department, which I'm I'm not hard on, but it just it's it's uh, I'm so I'm so involved in it and the look of the design and the and the, and the props and everything, of course, and and uh, you know I so said I I'm not a screamer. I'm pretty calm on set, so um, but. You know, to weigh it out, I'm, I'll be very, you know, I'll be, I'll be nice, but I, I'm, I'm very involved in, in right down to the, you know, paint jobs and everything. So, um, but I do, I do really love doing it, and I do, I do still draw off a fair amount. Hey. hey. Um, uh, just to have uh, two questions. Uh, what do you like to draw outside of? Uh, what do you like to draw like outside of film and art that, that, as artists, you know. Everyone likes to kind of relax and uh, take their time up and down. Uh, and the other question I have is, um, what's your next challenge in film? I mean, what's, what, do you, what, what do you call on the cards next? Uh, for the, the um, what do I draw just on the, the it, I was, it's all within a, uh, um, I, I do a lot of cartoon work as well, that that's, I find that's, that's a little bit more relaxing. Um, but I, and then it's a combination of that, and then I, I was, um, for a while I was, Deciding whether or not I would go into film or or do comic books, and I started in in, uh, in dabbling in comic books a little bit, and so part of that is what um, you know I'll, I'll I'll go in kind of a, a honestly what's weird is I draw more kind of fantasy oriented stuff, um, which is strange because I it's it's uh it's more fun to draw than something that is is uh, is more kind of practical based or to a to a movie. So it tends to be more fantasy oriented, slightly more cartoonish when I'm just free, just uh, you know, kind of uh, just just drawing for drawing's sake. And then what what I'm looking to do of, uh, you know, one I'd like to get to be able to, to get a few of my uh, my own projects out there. There's a few, you know, people ask me why I took off three three years between Die Hard and and Total Recall, and I just, I just you know laugh as it's for me. I felt like I was the the you know the busiest unemployed director in Hollywood. As like the I was working on it must have been a good five or six projects for sometimes you know four to you know seven I was working on this Tom Cruise movie called Motorcade for seven months like just hardcore that's all I was doing not going on vacations with the family not do, just you would never know if a movie is really going to get green lit or not and um, so I just feel like it's been movie after movie that I've been working on just hasn't come to light. Um, but a few of those projects were original scripts that I had written with with um, with other writers, and and so I'm really hoping to get some of those off the ground next, and um, and start doing some of my my own my own titles as well. Thanks very much, John. Uh, thank you, Len. That was very, very enjoyable and very insightful. Uh, my name is Fiona Ash. I'm a director as well. I was just wondering, what is your favorite part of the directing process? The favorite part is the, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's on the superficial level, the favorite part is being able to, um, to figure out something and make something really work that wasn't planned. Um, you feel very proud. That's when you feel, that's when I feel very creative is when you show up, something's not working. And you think, okay, now you know what? Maybe it comes back to it's like now it's like a therapy session for myself here. Um, w you know, it's what it's I kind of hundred euro an hour. Later. Yes, and when when I was back on sets and trying to say, what would I do? What would I? How would I solve this problem? Um, maybe it comes from that. I didn't even think about that until now. But I really do enjoy when something comes up and things aren't really working and then you're having to, you know, go grab this piece of set, let's go do this, why don't we change this thing here, change, you know, um, just e either change the idea of the scene itself dramatically or you change the, the look of it. But something you have to do in the moment, put it together and it really works and it becomes one of your favorite scenes and so often, I mean, as you, you, know, you know, that there's some scenes that you can really stress about, you just, on page, you go, this one I'm really worried about, I don't know how to make it happen. And then when you shoot it, put it all together, it can often be one of your favorite scenes ever. And that I find very rewarding and probably because it's, you're having to be creative right on the spot. You don't have a chance to talk to 200 people about how you're going to pull it off. You just have to just use your imagination, put it together, and that's where I feel the most like when I was probably in my garage putting something together and you know, spray painting this and doing this. And um, So I, I enjoy that part of it. Um, and then, you know, when you get a, for me when you, when you get a performance that is above what is on the page. Um, 
it just it gives you a thrill when something comes to life in a way that the actor does something or you're able to talk through and create something that that lifts it uh, more dramatically more emotionally than than what is on the page um, I think you just go home going like you just so jazzed about it so anybody else gentleman for us I do. I do. I let the editor do their editorial pass, and then honestly, I watch it like this. I just, I, and I'm not. I tell all the editors that I've. Um, I don't like to be in the room when the editor is there. When I'm watching it for the first time, I have a very hard time watching. Watching a first cut, especially something that somebody else has done, no matter how brilliant they are, it doesn't matter. It's something that you've spent so much time putting together. And I do shoot knowing how I'm going to edit a lot of the stuff, um, especially if it's an action sequence, then you know what you're collecting. I, I don't set up eight cameras and, and shoot a bunch of stuff and coverage and we'll deal with it later. It's much more of a sequence of, of shots for me. And so when I'm watching it, I, um, I freak out every time. I really do. It's, it's the, the highest anxiety for me is to watch somebody cutting what I've, what I've done. And one of the editors I was working with, I don't know where this comes from, but it's a very good, you know, that it's, um, you know, a, a, a movie is never as good as its dailies, but it's never as bad as the first cut. And I try to remember that as I'm watching the first cut every time. I want to watch the first cut of Underworld 1. Um, I, I, I'm so glad I was just on a one level flat. Uh, you know, I was like ready to just jump. And same, I mean, every movie, every movie. I, I watched Die Hard and I thought, holy shit, it's not... It's not funny. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, the, the the pacing's all wrong, and um, and I really kind of panic about it. And then honestly, you go in there, you you you, you, you know fix fix a lot of things. And often they don't change it that much sometimes. But it's just your, you know, uh, your your view of it. But to be honest, I find it the most one of the most difficult things in the process is is to uh, you know to watch what somebody else has put together for you. You know so. It's, it's quite tough. Is that just because the studio, because the schedules are usually quite tight, they have to cut as you're shooting? Or would you rather, in an ideal world, would you like to shoot, take a couple of weeks off, and then attend the edit from scratch? Or a hundred percent. I would prefer to do that. That's never really an option because there's too many factors. It, in, a, in a different kind of movie, yes, and I'm, I'm very you know, interested in doing, um, like I said, I love a thriller. I'd love to do a thriller that, one, I don't have the headache of visual effects and everything that, um, and I'd love to, to, to be able to have the freedom to just concentrate on that and actually have the time. Because when you're doing a movie that has so many visual effects and the, the time frame, the release date and everything, by the time that you're done shooting, you're already, from the moment you wrap, you're having to send out sections of the action sequences that, that embody a lot of the visual effects so that you can send off to the companies that you have to, as a director, buy off on. Um, so they can start working on the visual effects to hit the date. So by the time that I'm even done, I have to hand over too many sequences to start. A lady at the back here. Hi, um, just on the 3D thing, like most directors don't really seem to like 3D and most film fans don't really seem to like it. So aside from the kind of... Um, I guess the studio is wanting to squeeze a couple more dollars out of an admissions price. Where do you think the, the relentless drive for everything to be in 3D is still coming from, even though it doesn't really seem to be pleasing anyone? Avatar, <laughs> I think. Avatar was so brilliant and it worked so well. And I think it's a, obviously it had a huge impact on, on things. But I, I agree with you in terms of where is this need for 3D coming from. I don't run into that many people that say, I hope this is in 3D. I've actually never heard it. Um, nor do I have that many friends that say, uh, you know, I'm opting to go to 3D rather than, than 2D. So you don't, unless people are just really staying quiet, I have no idea either. Um, and obviously the ticket prices are higher. Um, I think there's, I understand a, a, a part of it and the commerce part of it that it's, it's um, 3D is, is something that you can only experience in its, in its form the, the correct way in a theater. So that's to get people to go back out to the theater again rather than you know, the piracy problem that we have or just waiting for it on DVD or you know, the, the movies come out on DVD like a week after they're on release now. It's, it's, it drives me crazy. Um, so the power of, of going to the theater has diminished a little bit. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, 
but then look at the, I think the backlash is so strong with people with 3D. So I don't know. I mean, I've, it's, um, my, my question is the same as yours, honestly, is who, where's, where's this really coming from if people are, are not that excited about it? Every time, I remember being at Comic-Con a couple years ago, or I don't know, anyway, and somebody announced that they were doing the movie in 2D, and like the whole crowd went crazy. <laughs> they went nuts. Um, it's uh, you know it may not make as much in the box office. It may it may not. So I don't I don't um, I I hope that there's that I, look I'd love everybody to be able to you know that that we do get more people out to the theaters um, and it doesn't require what I consider still a little bit of a gimmick um, you know depending on what kind of movie it is. But uh, I don't know. I, I I'm asking the same question as you are really. Lady here in the middle. Hi. Interested in maybe coming back and filming something in Ireland in the near future? I was like just thinking that on the on literally what we were like driving over, especially when it started to rain. <laughs> <laughs> I got, and, and I think somebody like, made it here. And they were, they were apologized to me like, oh, you know, sorry, it's not a very good day today. I'm looking around, and go, now this looks like somewhere I can shoot. Um, it's funny. There's there's something about like rain that people go, oh, where's the you know? There's a little in terms of like rain in this movie. I'll tell you one of the tricks of of uh, like when I talk about visual effects and having it look real. The, there's, the reason that it's raining in Total Recall is because visual effects look better if they have a natural element to them. And CG to me often looks too clean and plastic artificial. and artificial, slightly, slightly dim. Um, you put a layer of, of rain on it, you wet down. Why do you do that to a regular set? The reason we wet down regular sets is because they, they, they just they kick. They pop to life. You do that to CG, it's going to do the same thing. And, and because CG is already fake, you put a natural environment or a natural element onto that, whether it be smoke, dust, rain, or, and rain gives it the kick and a, and a, and a, a realism to it. That you should see the, the city before we did the rain pass and then the city after the rain pass goes from CG to looking real. Well, and um, so that's why the movie's very wet. Well, you wouldn't need CG here. No. <laughs> no, and I love that it's, it's a, a great look here. Yeah. No, I was, I was literally, swear to God, thinking about that on the way over. I saw another hand up here. Hi, in the back. Could you repeat that for me? Sorry. The, the, no, I think you're asking Observer State what I was um, thinking about Kate as, as, as Melina. Yeah. Um, no, not, not necessarily, and also because I'd already, I'd already cast, um, I'd already cast Melina as, as well. So um, the process with with Kate was a very weird one um, because she was she was shooting Underworld Two um, that 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 I was I was producing at the same time as doing this, which I'll never ever do again. Um, and so she wasn't going to be available uh, for 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 Lori anyway. And then we pushed our movie by two two and a half weeks, and that became so the, so Kate was. Um, was was late into the mix of of becoming available anyway, so that was so uh, it just it just never really came. And also, I wanted what I was looking for for Lori was this combination of um, you know she need to be she's this badass character and she's going to go through action and all that that that's kind of a given. Um, and we're very you know I think people are are uh, you know they accept that about about Kate, but there's um, there's a whole quality to Lori that. I wanted that I, I know that people are not very familiar with with Kate and that she's uh, she has a very fast a, a wicked sense of humor humor and, a, and a, I wanted Lori to have a, a kind of a cunning almost taunting fun quality of evil of evil <laughs> of just uh, being able to like you know that she just had You're a slight craziness but see I know this, this shit yeah. I know these things <laughs> this is what is very strange for is me where like, like I know you've got I know you've got that look that I'm looking for for you looking at Quake because that's what you do when you look at me when I'm doing do this thing and, and that's why I'm going to use it you, she couldn't do that at home could she what's that I don't want to pry into your private life but if, <laughs> if my wife looked at me the way that your wife looks at you on that set yes every I, Tuesday I don't think I'd be able to do that what's it like to watch your wife kiss Colin Farrell on a Tuesday morning uh, I do the same things with the editor. I do like I do a little bit of that. <laughs> now it's um it's all it's because I'll, t I'll tell you what what really helps is that I have the the panic button of 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 cut. Oh, cut you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the minute that I the first time the the first first take they're getting closer like cut 
So it was, it was, it was cut before they even kissed. Um, and actually is, is more, I do think, with all the silliness and everything, it's more uncomfortable for Colin. Um, and it sounds weird because you think, oh, it would be more uncomfortable for, for me. Or, but it's um, it, because he's the one kissing the director's wife. wife. Yeah. And how, how does he go about, like, how far does he take it? Where are his hands okay? I had to literally go over and say, it's okay to, if you want to just, like, move your hand down a little bit here. Okay, okay, that's okay. Okay, okay, I'll do that. Um, you know, but then I feel weird. And you're like, well, I'm like, I don't want to direct him on that and where he... You know, so I kind of back. I give him less direction. He has less direction. Um, and so, I mean, really, one of the things that was the most difficult about that scene was to get... It's, like, it's amazing that we got anything sexy out of it at all because it was so... Um, it was actually just... Yeah. No, more just like them just, just goofing around and just laughing. To get them to stop laughing uh, was, was, was kind of harder than, than anything else. But um, I think I fired him twice. Uh, you know, so it is what it is, but it's, um, I will tell you though, it's amazing how I learned this on Underworld too, um, that if you're ever directing a love scene with anybody that you care about or girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, just call cut very, very loud. Because if you call cut and they don't stop kissing, yeah, your blood actually. immediately goes up really fast and I used to be in that underworld. Too. I was, you know, it's a very delicate set. It always is in an underworld. Um, you know, Scott Speedman, who's a very dear friend of ours, anyway, so that helps. But it's, it's, uh, you know, and they're doing this, like they're making out, and so it's all, it's always a really, you know, closed set, really quiet. And I'm trying to be polite with every everybody else, and I go, okay, and cut, and they keep kissing, like, cut, <laughs> cut, and and so now it's like I'm on total recall with a, you know, a bullhorn. bullhorn, yeah. We're going to have to leave it there because Len has to catch a plane. But again, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.